Hebrews 12, verse 15. It says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. But today in this service, we're going to begin in the middle of the verse where the Bible says, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Today I want to talk to you about bitterness, offense, and unforgiveness. What do you do if you have a root of bitterness? If someone has offended you, if you're carrying wounds from the past that torment you and keep you torn up, how can you step out of those emotions and become free of them? Well, first of all, in verse 15, the Bible refers to this as a root of bitterness. And I want you to either underline or circle this word root in verse 15. This word root is the Greek word ridza. And the word ridza describes something that is deeply, deeply rooted. And this is very important because it tells us that bitterness, unforgiveness, and strife, these are not superficial issues, but rather these are things which become deeply, deeply rooted in the heart and in the soul. And in fact, the roots of bitterness are so deep, they can even pass from one generation all the way to another generation. This is the problem with prejudice. Most people who are prejudiced today are not prejudiced because of something which has happened to them right now in their life, but it's because of something which happened in their grandparents' life or their great-grandparents' life. And that root of bitterness has passed from one generation to the next generation to the next generation and into the next generation. And unfortunately, the root of bitterness was nurtured through every generation. And even though this generation has never personally experienced anything bad, they carry the bitterness passed to them by previous generations. We see this in Russia. You know, Denise and I learned prejudice does not have a thing to do with color. That's just one manifestation of prejudice. Prejudice is spiritual. In the former Soviet Union, everyone is the same color. But the prejudice there is just as deep as you can imagine. The Estonians and the Latvians and the Lithuanians hate the Russians because of what the Russians did to their great-grandparents. The Ukrainians and the Moldavians and the Belarusians, they hate the Russians for what they did to their grandparents. As you go through the whole 15 Soviet republics, all of them bear scars and they carry hatred toward the Russians for what they did to their grandparents. But this generation, they've not experienced anything foul at the hand of the Russians. In fact, Russians and Latvians have grown up side by side. Russians and Ukrainians have grown up side by side. They've never had a conflict. They speak the same language. They have the same experience. Yet they carry in their heart a hatred toward Russians because that hatred was passed to them from their grandparents to their parents to them. And now they're even passing it to their children. A root of bitterness. Now this word bitterness is the Greek word pikria. And the word pikria is a Greek word which describes, and I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. It describes inward feelings of hostility. Inward feelings of hostility. This word bitterness, the Greek word pikria, describes a person that is inwardly sour. And this is why it can be translated bitterness. This word pikria can be translated to be caustic or sharp or cynical or sarcastic. And in fact, this word pikria is such a nasty word that it even describes a scowl showing up on a person's face. An inwardly bitter person that outwardly looks bitter. Well, now this shouldn't surprise us because Jesus taught that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let's all say it. Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks, which means the mouth is the release valve for the heart. And for this reason, it is never hard to determine what is inside a person's heart. 
All you have to do is let a person talk. And their mouth will reveal their heart. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you're filled with is what is going to dominate your conversation. If you're filled with money, 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 what are you going to talk about? Money. If you're filled with business and business dominates your heart, what are you going to talk about? Business. If you're filled with bitterness and the hate and it rages inside your heart, then what's going to dominate your mouth? Bitterness, rage, unforgiveness. Because out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. It's a principle that cannot be changed. Even if you say to yourself, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. No, Rick, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Oh, I want to say it. I'm not going to say it. I pledge to you, Lord, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm not going to say it. There it went. <laughs> you said it even though you said you wouldn't say it. Why? Because you can't help it. When you're filled with bitterness, you speak bitterness. That's what Jesus said. If you're filled with faith, what do you speak? Faith. Praise God. Let's make sure we have hearts filled with faith. Well, I want to give you an illustration from our life. When we first moved to the former Soviet Union, there was a Pentecostal pastor who had many connections in the nation. In fact, it seemed like he could do anything. And he came to me and he said, I would like to help you begin your television ministry. And he was a Pentecostal pastor, so I trusted him and was so thankful that he wanted to help me begin my television ministry. He had a son that was a builder. His son built houses. And so his son said to me, would you like to have a house? Denise and I said, yes, we would. And at that time, you could build a house in Latvia for $10,000. $10,000 was like $100,000 in that economy. So we signed the deal to build the house. We paid the $10,000, and he kept coming back for more money and more money and more money, and finally we paid $22,000, and there still was no house. There was only a foundation. And one day this builder came by our house. I was not home at the time, so he spoke to Denise. And he said, Denise, I've spent all your money you don't have a house, and I don't have any money to build your house. So I'm going to go to Germany to find some money. And Denise reached out, laid hands on his shoulders, and prayed, Father, I ask you to help my brother go down to Germany and find money. And he left. And we didn't hear from him for three months. And I kept saying to his Pentecostal father, where is your son? He would say, don't worry about my son. Soon he'll be home. Every time I asked him, he was evasive. It's like he didn't want to answer my question, where is your son? And one day we were holding a huge meeting. We had 8,000 people in the auditorium. And I was standing next to this Pentecostal father whose son was our builder that has now disappeared. And at the end of the meeting... Someone brought me the national newspaper. And right on the front of the national newspaper was the picture of the Pentecostal pastor standing next to me and his builder son that had disappeared for three months. And the headline announced that this Pentecostal pastor and his son who was building our house were the leaders of a Russian mafia operation. And they used the church as a front for their organization. And the reason we hadn't seen his son for three months is because when Denise laid her hands on him and prayed for him to go down to Germany and find money, he went down to Germany, pulled out a revolver, kidnapped a man, and demanded $300,000 ransom. He went to find money. He had been arrested by Interpol and was in prison in Denmark. And that's why we hadn't seen him 
for three months. And I held the newspaper in my hand. And looked at the pastor standing next to me. And then it dawned on me. The Russian mafia helped us start our television ministry. This man was a criminal. Everything about him was criminal. Everything about this man was criminal. Do you know that when the Soviet Union collapsed, previous to that, there was an office in the city of Riga where the Soviet Union issued all of their visas for foreigners. Well, when that office closed, this criminal had a contact in that office. And he stole all the documents and all of their stamps. And he sold 1,000 multi-entry year-long visas for $100 a pop. That's $100,000. The visas were totally bogus. He signed them. He stamped them. And we were all living there on phony visas, and we didn't even know it. In fact, one day, the U.S. ambassador came to our office because we had the greatest number of Americans working in our office in the whole country. We had the biggest group. And so he came down to see us one day in our offices, and we all went to lunch together. And as we sat there, we said to the ambassador, have you been to Moscow? He said, no, I can't get a visa. And my staff said, hey, we can help you. All of us simultaneously pulled out our visas, and he said, fold those up, put them in your pockets, and let's pretend you never showed me those visas. They were all bogus. And he had sold a 1,000 of them at $100 each. This man was just a criminal, a Pentecostal pastor. And as the weeks passed, and I began to think about this man and think about his criminal son who had stolen our $22,000 and the lies that he had perpetrated to the body of Christ, the more I thought about him, I became filled with the thoughts of that man. And when Denise and I were alone by ourselves, I would begin to rail that man. And Denise would say, sweetheart, you better deal with your heart. And I would say, sweetheart, I am not the one with the heart problem. What do you mean? I better deal with my heart. But you see, there was a root of bitterness which was beginning to grow on the inside of me. And do you see what the next thing says in this verse? Lest any root of bitterness springing up. Everybody say springing up. Yeah. Springing up is the Greek word fool. It describes a little bitty tiny blade of grass which begins to push its way up through the soil. Now, when you first see it, you may not think it's serious because it's so small. But if that thing is beginning to push through the soil, that is evidence that down under the soil, there is a seed that is starting to produce life. And you better grab that thing when it first starts to spring up. Easier to rip it out then than to let it get out of control and then have a major root of bitterness to deal with. And if we'll pay attention to our mouth and our attitude, we will notice when a root of bitterness begins to spring up. Well, I begin to hear myself rail this man. And I knew that I was wrong. But you know, sometimes when you're wrong, you feel justified in what you feel. And I felt very justified that this man was a criminal. I felt justified that I didn't want anybody to be close to that man, and I wanted everybody to know what a slime ball he was because I didn't want anybody else to be hurt. And I justified the bitterness that was in my heart. And Denise kept saying, honey, you better deal with your heart. Honey, you better deal with your heart. And then one day, I called my boys into the living room. And I said, boys, we're going to pray. I want you to agree in prayer with me because your mother will not agree with me. 
And so we joined hand, the renter men. I said, now I'm going to pray, and I want you to agree in prayer. And my oldest son said, Daddy, what are we going to pray? I said, I'm going to pray. You agree. We're going to ask God to kill this man. Now, friends, I had scriptures. You know, you can find a scripture for anything, and I had scriptures. If you read the Psalms, David prayed some pretty hot prayers about his enemies, and I was standing on every one of those scriptures. And I said to my boys, your mother won't agree, so you just agree with me in prayer. And my oldest son looked at me and said, Daddy, I don't think we can agree with that prayer. <laughs> and when I heard the precious voice of my little boy and realized I was leading my children in a prayer for God to kill somebody, <laughs> it was like a ray of revelation went through my mind. This is not right. You're a gospel preacher. You're supposed to bring light, love, healing, deliverance, revelation. You ought to be praying for this man to repent and for his life to change. And instead, you're praying for him to die. And you see my mouth revealed what was in my heart. And your mouth will reveal what is inside your heart. Now, let me tell you a little experiment you ought to do that could be very painful. Ask your spouse, ask your closest friends what you talk about more than anything else. You see, we always perceive ourselves as being so crystal clear. But ask other people, what do you hear me talk about more than anything else? And be willing to receive their answer. And what they tell you may reveal something to you about your spiritual condition. Because out of the fullness of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. Now, wait a minute. Look at the rest of verse 15. Lest any root of bitterness springing up do what? Trouble you. Trouble you. This word trouble could be translated, and I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. It could be translated to harass, to harass, torment, torment, to vex, to hound, to stalk like a stalker, or to annoy. Again, to harass, to torment, to vex, to hound, to stalk like a stalker, or to be annoyed. This is a picture of a very troubled person. Now let me go back to my illustration of the Pentecostal pastor. I had to go to the United States to preach. And back in those days, I had a one-hour daily television program. And when you have an hour daily television program, you are like a slave to your television camera. You just live in front of a camera. And for me to get ahead of programs so that I could go to the States meant that I had to go into the studio and do eight hours of TV for five straight days. Well, my staff knew that I would be doing a lot of filming in the studio, and they had been wanting to upgrade the studio, and specifically, they wanted new lights. So I gave them a budget. I said, this is what you can spend. Go buy some lights. And so they came back with 32 new lights, and they filled the studio with these new lights. That day, I came into the studio, and I said, let's begin to film. Well, now, in the former Soviet Union, there is no air conditioning. And this was the summertime. And so my staff had worked out an arrangement that I would wear a suit from the waist up. And from the waist down, I wore shorts. <laughs> and I would sit in my chair, and of course, the whole Soviet Union thought I was so dignified, but they didn't see what I really looked like. 
and they filmed me from here up. But from here down, I wore shorts. And because the studio was so hot, the guys came up with the idea that I should sit with one foot each in a bucket of water. <laughs> and the water would kind of help keep me cool. And so I would tell people to open their Bibles and I would begin to teach and they would film from here up, but from here down I was half naked, <laughs> head on shorts, and each foot was in a bucket of water. <laughs> well, we did two hours of TV programs that day. And then I pulled my feet out of the buckets of water and I walked next door into the edit suite to see how the programs looked. And the guys were all bent over, playing with the knobs on the monitors, and they said, there's something wrong with the monitors. Your face is red. I said, you know, we don't have time to mess with this. I'm leaving town. We've got to film programs. So I went back into the studio, put my feet in the buckets of water, sat down in my chair, and did four more hours of programs. At the end of four hours, I took a break, went back into the studio, edit suite, and the guys were still leaned over messing with the monitors, and they said, Pastor, your face is looking redder and redder the longer that we film. We don't know what's wrong with these monitors. So I went back into the studio. We did two more hours of programs. Now we've done six hours of programs, eight hours of programs. And I am so hot in that studio. And finally, at the end of eight hours, I got up, walked into the edit suite, and they turned to congratulate me on doing eight hours of programs. And when they looked at me, they realized the problem was not the monitors, it was me. My face was completely red. And that's when they and I discovered all those 32 lights were Sun lamps. <laughs> Has anybody here ever been burnt by a sun lamp? Would you raise your hand? Has anybody here ever laid in front of 32 sun lamps for eight hours? My head was burned, my face was burned, my hands were burned, my neck was burned, my legs were burned, and my feet were really burned because they had been in the water. And you know what happens when you're in water. It just magnifies the effects of the sun. Do you know who sold them those sun lamps? The Pentecostal preacher. And he knew what he was doing. That night I went home so burned. Denise, I'll tell you, I'm not exaggerating. In some places, I had a second degree burn. I was so burned. And the worst part was my eyes. Because for eight hours, I had looked into 32 huge sun lamps. We didn't even know if I would wake up with sight the next morning. Every time I blinked, it felt like my eyes were dragging shreds of glass across my eyeballs. I screamed out to God that night because the pain was so horrific. And back in those days, there were no medications. You couldn't buy solar cane for a sunburn. And the only thing the doctor could recommend was mayonnaise. So they went to the store and bought jars and jars of mayonnaise and came home, dipped their hands into the mayonnaise and began to put mayonnaise on my face, mayonnaise on my head, mayonnaise on my hands, mayonnaise on my legs, mayonnaise all over my feet. Now, you know, it's already bad enough to be burned, but to be bathed in mayonnaise. And then so, the mayonnaise would remain moist. They wrapped me in cellophane <laughs> to keep the moisture in the mayonnaise next to my body. So there's my burned body covered with mayonnaise wrapped up in cellophane. I felt a little bit like a hot dog. 
And the whole night I laid there thinking about that Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> Three days later, I had to go to the United States. You know, when you're scheduled to preach, you go. So I put on big sunglasses. I mean, the smallest, faintest light was painful to my eyes. Put a big hat on my head so no sun would touch my head on the way to the airport. Walked onto the plane. Took my seat, so embarrassed the way that I looked and I smelled like mayonnaise still. <laughs> And I lowered my head and began to think about that preacher. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there was a tap on my shoulder. I lowered my glasses and looked up. It was the Pentecost preacher. <laughs> he was on the same flight with me to Helsinki. And before I knew what was happening, he said, oh, I heard you burnt yourself. I'm going to pray for you. And before I could say no, he slapped his hand on my face and said, Father, in the name of Jesus, heal him. Now, you know, this was an amazing thing to me. That criminal preacher had signs and wonders. And when he took his hands off of my face, my eyes were healed. Now you say hallelujah. I didn't say hallelujah. I didn't want that healing. I said to the Lord, I'd rather be blind than be healed through that man. It just hacked me off. The thought of that man harassed me. It hounded me. It stalked me like a stalker. Now let me ask you, has anybody ever offended you? And they were just as free as a bird. In fact, they didn't even seem to be bothered by what they did to you. But it just ate you up on the inside. And every time you saw them, you relive the whole memory of that event, but they're not even bothered. Doesn't that make you even matter that they're not bothered? I was troubled. And look what the next part of the verse says. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, harass you, vex you, stalk you, hound you, annoy you, trouble you, and thereby what many be defiled now you might say you know what my root, my root of bitterness is my personal problem if i want to be bitter i can be bitter my bitter is my problem my bitterness isn't anybody else's business it only affects me liar that's a lie that is an absolute lie out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. When you're inwardly defiled and you begin to speak it, you defile everybody who's around you. And in fact, this word defile used in this verse is the Greek word spilos. It means to spill, to spot, or to stain. Now let's say that you have a beautiful white carpet in your living room. And I come walking across your living room with a gla grass, glass of grape juice. And oh, I trip, and there goes that grape juice all over your white carpet. So you quickly jump down, and you begin to scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub, but you're not going to get grape juice out of white carpets. And as the months go by, every time you walk across that room and you see that stain, it serves as a Permanent reminder. Everybody say, permanent reminder. Of the night 
when a record runner came walking across your living room with a grape juice and every time you see the stain it brings all those memories back into your mind because the stain serves as a permanent reminder now let me bring this home to you let's say that you have a problem with somebody in this church you're bitter you're angry you're filled with unforgiveness you know you ought to forgive and you ought to get over it. Everybody say, get over it. <laughs> but you're just not willing to get over it. You hang on to it. So one day you decide to confide in your friend. Come up here, brother. You know, it's dangerous to sit on the front row. <laughs> and so I say to Reggie, you know, Reggie, I'm going to tell you something I have never told anybody else. I don't want you to repeat this. I don't want anybody else to know, but I just have to get this off my heart. Do you see that brother over there? <laughs> just between you and me, don't ever trust that man. He did wrong to me. He will do wrong to you. He stabbed me in the back and twisted the sword as it went in. And I'm going to tell you, that man is as low as they come and he will tell you he loves Jesus but don't you believe it not for a minute <laughs> now at this moment Reggie has never had any contact with that man but when I'm finished talking to Reggie I have permanently stained his view of that man and every time he sees that man He's going to think about the words of Rick Renner. My bitterness defiled a man, twisted his opinion, and gave him a problem with somebody he never previously had a problem with. Are you listening? Now, this happens in churches all the time. For instance, say that a man comes to this church. And his life has changed in this church. Just changed. His marriage is restored. His finances are put together. His children are healed. His life has been changed in this church. And because it's been changed, he loves his pastors. And he ought to love his pastors. But in a certain sense, he's elevated his pastors so high in his mind that he's bound to be disappointed. Even though you should honor your pastors, and I am a pastor, I'm going to tell you that your pastors are human beings, and sometimes they do very human things. They can't help that. They're people. And sometimes we do ourselves a discredit by elevating almost people to the status of idol. And then when they do something natural or normal, then you feel tripped up by that. You feel let down because they weren't what you thought they were. No, they're human, just like everybody else. They have to walk in faith, just like you. They have to walk in love, just like you. They have to learn as a husband and a wife to speak kindly to each other, just like you. But one day this man sees Randy and Roberta do something that he doesn't like. And because he doesn't have the maturity to overlook that, he begins to get under his skin. And the more he thinks about it, the more bothered he becomes. And it's almost like he puts on a new set of glasses. And those glasses enable him now to see everything he doesn't like about the Morrisons. Now he's looking through the eyes of a fence. And whereas before he loved them and he honored them, now he criticizes them. Rather than come to church and rejoice in the Lord, he comes to church to nitpick. Because nitpick is in his heart. Before he loved Randy's accent. Now he didn't like it at all. 
before he loved the color purple. <laughs> now it was the, why does everything around here have to be the same color all the time? Why did they have to have another new stage? Why this, why that? He can't see anything good anymore because he's been offended and he's seen everything through the eyes of offense. And then he goes home after church. Sits down with his family to have dinner. And he begins to chew out the pastor and chew up the church while his children sit around the other end of the table. His little children who loved the church and honored their pastor who couldn't wait to come to church every week. But by the time the father is finished running his mouth, he has so stained the minds and the conscience of his children. And you know, children really feel what their parents feel. That now when they hear the name Randy Morrison, they think of a man that hurt their papa. When they think of the church, they think of a church that is painful. And that's why the kids don't want to go to church now. Because papa stained the minds and the consciences of his children. Now here's the problem. This is the sad part. Eventually, Papa gets his heart right with God. And he's all right. He's restored to the pastor. He's restored to the church. And he's all right. But now, he has children that are not all right. Because he defiled them. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? But now wait. Let's say this is you, that you are the one that has a root of bitterness. And you don't want to live in this anymore. How do you step out of it? How do you begin the process of reversal? Turn to Luke 17, verse 1. Luke 17, verse 1. Everyone turn there. You need to see this. Luke 17, verse 1. Jesus said to the disciples, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. But that offenses will come. Jesus wasn't the bearer of bad news. Jesus was just real. As long as you live with human beings, there is going to be a possibility to be offended. And not only that, there will be a possibility that you might offend somebody else. Has anybody here ever offended somebody? Were you shocked when you found out that you offended them? When you heard what they perceived you to say, were you stunned that anybody would ever think that you would say anything like that? Of course you were stunned. You didn't wake up that day and say, huh, today is the day. I'm going to offend as many people as I can. No, 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 no. You probably said something very sincerely, but it was misperceived, and therefore it was offenses. In fact, most major conflicts in the world, including military conflicts, are based on perceptions and misperceptions. Communication is it. And because we're not all skilled communicators, it means sometimes we hurt feelings and don't even know that we hurt feelings. Sometimes we think we're saying things right, but they really weren't said right. Or they, they were said right, but because the other person woke up in a bad mood, they didn't receive it right. So there's all kinds of reasons why people get offended. The word offense, which Jesus uses here, the Greek word scandalous, it's where you get the word scandal. When a person is offended, it means they've had some kind of a scandal in their soul. Now, people only get offended for two reasons. There's just two categories of offense. That's it. There's no more. Write these down. Category number one, people get offended because of what someone said or what someone did. Category number two, people get offended because of what someone did not say and what somebody did not do. For instance, somebody goes to the hospital 
and they wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for somebody to come see them and nobody comes to see them, nobody calls them and they lay in the hospital and think, after everything I've done with that church, after I've served for all of these years, I've given to every special offering and nobody has called me. And they become offended because of what somebody didn't say and what somebody didn't do. This recently happened to me. I came to our church building that we rent, and the director of that building wanted to meet with me that day. I was late to church because of the traffic. Moscow has 16 million people, and sometimes you just get stuck in traffic. The service was supposed to start in one minute, and this woman was demanding to meet with me before church. So I came into the building. My mind was just on one thing. I've got to go see that woman and get into the service. I came in very focused, went straight into her office, not realizing I walked past a man. I never even saw a man. I was just thinking about getting to this woman's office. That man became so offended because I didn't shake his hand. I didn't even see him. And when I went to him, he was so offended that he stomped away from me and would not speak to me. I didn't mean to offend that man. I didn't even see that man. But that kind of thing offends people all the time. Such and such didn't speak to me. They didn't speak to me. Or for women. She didn't even notice I got my hair colored. It's crazy the things people get offended about. But primarily two categories, because of what people say or do, or what people don't say and don't do. Isn't that funny? Isn't that just funny how silly we are? Well, now Jesus said, as long as you live in this earth, it is impossible that offenses will not come. But now when you get offended, what are you supposed to do? Verse 3 is the answer. Jesus said in King James Version, take heed to yourself. The Greek literally says, get a grip on yourself. Now, when you're offended, you want to get a grip on somebody else. But Jesus said, get a grip on yourself. Why did he say that? Because you live in a natural world with natural people and no one will ever do everything right. And if your happiness and your contentment is always dependent on everybody around you doing everything right, you are never going to be a happy person. So rather than focus on what this person does wrong and this one and this one and this one and this one, Jesus said, hey, get a grip on yourself. Regulate yourself, manage yourself, and then you can live with anybody. You can even live with the most offensive people. And be happy if you get a grip on yourself. And then Jesus said, notice what he said next. If your brother trespassed against you, a better translation would be if your brother violates you. I like that translation because today in America, everybody feels like they're violated. Everybody has this right, that right, this right, that. There's so many kinds of abuse. We need a whole new dictionary just to define all the new kinds of abuse. Well, Jesus said, if you feel violated, if your brother violates you, rebuke him. In this particular case, confront him. Talk about it. That's the mature thing to do. And if he what? Repents. Thou shalt forgive him. Everybody say forgive. forgive. Look at the next verse. And if your brother violates you seven times in one day and turns to you and repents, thou shalt what? Forgive. Forgive. So now in verse 3 and verse 4, we have the word forgive twice. We'll take a note. This word forgive is the Greek word aphiemi, aphiemi. The word aphiemi translated forgive all over the New Testament, means this, and I want you to write this down, to permanently dismiss, to permanently dismiss. 
It could be translated to send away. To send away. It could be translated to permanently release. Release. This gives insight to Psalm 103 when the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So it means to dismiss, to permanently send away, to remove, to release. And a modern day paraphrase, a modern day translation, a good one would be, let it go. Everybody say it. Let it go. Turn to your neighbor and say, let it go. So now you could translate the verse. Verse 3, get a grip on yourself. If your brother violates your rights and you confront him and he tells you he's sorry and truly repents, thou shalt let it go. And then Jesus took it another step. And if your brother violates you seven times in one day and is sorry and repents, thou shalt let it go. Let it go. Well, now most of us are willing to forgive once. And we think pretty highly of ourselves for being so merciful. And most of us don't forgive really. This is the way most people forgive. No one, no one has ever hurt me as bad as you've hurt me. <laughs> After all the years that I walked with you, I trusted you, and you betrayed me. Nobody, you can't imagine how horrible I feel the hell that you have dragged me through, but I've worked through it. <laughs> and because of who I am, in my mercy, I'm gonna let it go. That's the way most people forgive each other. They forgive, but not until you feel really bad before you're forgiven. Is this the truth? So you forgive them, you work through it, you let it go. And then that person does the same thing again a month later. A month later. You think, how could they do this to me again? God, help me, Lord. This torment that they could hurt me again. But God, I'll forgive them again. And then a month goes by and they do it again. And another month and they do it again. Did you know that some people are just naturally offensive? They can't help it. They were just kind of born that way. They've got a bad character. Their parents taught them no culture. They're always saying something so rude, but they don't mean to. Well, Jesus said, if they sin seven times in one day, not over seven months or three months, if they do it again and again and again and again and again and again all in the same day, but they have a heart to again and again and again and again and again say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, I don't know why I did it, then thou shalt let it go. Now that's a real test for your spirituality. You know it's really hard on the flesh is when you're upset with somebody and you want that person to feel bad about what they did. You think they ought to feel bad. And so you say to them, I just have to tell you, what you did really hurt me. 
Nobody has ever done this to me. And you lay your whole case before them. Your flesh wants to hear them say, I'm a worm. I'm the lowest person on the face of the earth. How could you ever trust me again? That's what your flesh wants to hear. But when their response is simply, gee, I'm so sorry, would you please forgive me? It's such a letdown to what the flesh wanted because you wanted to see them pine away right in your presence. You wanted to see a little misery before you utter the words, forgiven. And when they just say, gee, I'm sorry, would you please forgive me? <laughs> yes. And you go away upset again, offended because they repented so easy. Isn't this where people live? Jesus said, let it go. And the apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. And what? Everybody now tries to turn it into a faith teaching. This doesn't have a thing to do with faith. Do you know why they said, Lord, increase our faith? Because everybody uses their faith as an excuse. Well, I would be healed if I had enough faith. Well, I would be prospered if I had enough faith. Well, I could do better if I was like you and I had the faith that you have. And now the apostles are saying, well, we could forgive seven times in a day, but, you know, we don't have enough faith for that. And so Jesus answered them, shut up. I don't want to hear another word about this faith. If you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, which means it doesn't take any faith to forgive. It just takes a decision. If you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, thou shalt say to this sycamine tree, be plucked up by the roots and be planted into the sea, and it will obey you. But now hang on. Jesus uses the sycamine tree. Everybody say sycamine tree. As an example or an illustration of bitterness, unforgiveness, and offense. Why didn't Jesus say, thou shalt say to the pine tree? Or thou shalt say to the palm tree? Or thou shalt say to the cactus? A cactus would have looked like bitterness. Why did he say Sycamine tree. Well, we have an office in Oxford, England. And that's where is Oxford University. And so Denise and I were in Oxford several years ago at Christmas, and I did a little study at the university about the sycamine tree. And I want you to write these things down. Five points about the sycamine tree. Number one, the sycamine tree had the deepest root structure of all trees in the Middle East. Number two, the sycamine tree flourished in arid conditions where there were no water. Point number three, sycamine wood was the preferred wood for building caskets. Number four, the sycamine fruit looked very similar to the mulberry fruit. But the mulberry fruit was sweet and was eaten by rich people. The sycamine fruit was so bitter, it was so sour, that it was only eaten by poor people. So sour, no one could devour the whole fruit in one sitting. It required many nibblings on separate occasions. You had to nibble on it and leave it for a while. And come back and nibble on it and leave it for a while. And number five. Now listen to this one. The sycamine tree was not naturally pollinated. The only way this tree was pollinated then and now was when a wasp stuck its stinger into the fruit of the tree. And the sting of the wasp started the pollination process. Why did Jesus use the sycamine tree? Because unforgiveness, like the sycamine tree, has the deepest root structure of all. 
Unforgiveness, like the sycamine tree, flourishes in arid conditions where there's no movement of God. Unforgiveness, like the sycamine tree, is casket material. It will bury your spiritual life. Unforgiveness like the sycamine fruit is bitter fruit. You can't devour unforgiveness at once. You nibble on those memories and leave them for a while and come back to nibble again and leave them for a while. And you keep coming back to nibble and nibble and nibble and nibble. And slowly, over a long period of time, you begin to swallow the fruit of bitterness. And last... When does unforgiveness and bitterness begin in most people's hearts? When they feel like they've been stung by somebody. That's why Jesus used the sycamine tree. Now, how do you get rid of it? If that thing's roots are already growing in your heart, how do you get rid of it? And here's where everybody wants a magical answer. Everybody wants the counselor to tell them, step one, two, three, lay hands on me, cast bitterness out of my life. Everybody wants a magic answer. But the answer, we, we've already read it. It's right here. Jesus said, thou shalt say. Everybody say it. Thou shalt say. And the Greek is a participle, which means you would translate it. Thou shalt say and 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 say. It is a determined attitude. I'm not going to stop until I'm free. This is not just trying it once to see if it works, but thou shalt say and say and say and say and say and habitually keep saying it and saying it and saying it and saying it. Be plucked up by the roots. Be cast into the sea. Now, here's where somebody in every crowd says, yeah, 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 right. This is just a claim it teaching. Say it, claim it, right? I'm just going to speak my years of bitterness. Bitterness be plucked up by the roots and be cast into the sea. Yay, hallelujah, I'm free, right. That easy? You tell me I'm just going to speak to myself, look in the mirror, say bitterness. Be plucked up by the roots and be cast into the sea. Right, sure, uh-huh. I'm going to be that free, that easy? No, I didn't say it'd be easy. And Jesus didn't say thou shalt say. He said thou shalt say and 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 say. Now why did he say thou shalt say? What is the power in speaking it? Because your voice represents your authority. You're taking authority over your emotions. Authority over your will. Authority over your mind. You're making a decision that you're not going to be a victim and a slave to these emotions anymore. Now, here's the problem with most Christians. And again, I am one. So I'm not criticizing, but this is the truth. Most Christians just sit around and listen to themselves. Their head it has an open door for any old thought that comes through. And eventually, you have to stop listening to yourself, and you have to start speaking to yourself. And Jesus is speaking to slaves. People that are entrapped by years of bitterness. And Jesus says the only way you're going to get out of this is if you make a decision and you start taking authority and you speak to yourself and you speak to your mind and you speak to your emotions and you tell that bitterness, be plucked up by the roots and don't stop speaking it and dealing with it until you're free. And in fact, Jesus said, put it in the sea. Why not in the junk pile? It would reroot, but the sea is salt water. It will die in the sea. This is not permanent help till you can get back to your next counseling session. This is permanent removal, permanent freedom. And Jesus ended this by saying, It shall what? 
obey you. Your emotions will obey you if you'll speak to them. And if you don't speak to them, they will run all over you. Emotions are like kids. How many of you can remember when you first had little kids? You know little kids will push you to the limit. And if you don't take authority over your kids, they will take authority over you. I remember when our kids were little and they were all out of control. Denise and I would say to each other, well, they're asking for a spanking. You know, kids want borders. They want perimeters. And the flesh is the same way. When your flesh and your mind and your thoughts get out of control, you've got to speak to it and you've got to take authority or it will take authority over you. Now, somebody might say, oh, how would he know anything about bitterness? Well, I have a reason the way I am. I was rejected when I was in my mama's womb. And then when I was born, I was dropped on my head. And my daddy drank. And I have an excuse to be the way that I am. I am dysfunctional with a reason. I just can't help myself. It's the family that I'm from. You know, we all have excuses for dysfunction. All of us. Everybody has a story, even me. When I was a kid, I wouldn't like any of the other kids. I remember I used to watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer every year at Christmas. And there was the land of broken and forsaken toys. Nobody wanted to play with them. And I always identified with those broken and forsaken toys because I was such a weird kid, nobody wanted to be around me. <laughs> they all wanted to play basketball, football, baseball, soccer. I hated every ball. <laughs> I couldn't dribble, I couldn't pitch, I couldn't catch. I hated those balls. I liked to paint. I used pastels. <laughs> and all the kids thought I was a freak. And every Friday night, <sighs> little Ricky Renner sat on the porch, 350 Southwest 44th Street. all by myself. I wanted somebody to call me. I wanted Jerry Dale to call me, but Jerry Dale liked Paul Berger. Nobody ever included me. Stanley Wilkins wouldn't call me. Nobody would ever call me. And I would sit with my dog on my lap. His name was Samson. And at my side was my cat. Her name was Delilah. <laughs> Every Friday night, I would sit there with Samson and Delilah. Now you're laughing. But you know, those are the kind of excuses that people use for why they are the way they are. You know what? It's time to get over it. You've walked with God long, God long enough. It's time that you ought to be beyond that kind of stuff. There comes a time when you got to grow up. If you live in prison perpetually, it's because you haven't done what's necessary to walk out of that prison. And your pastor doesn't hold the key. You do. you got to put it in the latch and say, I'm coming free. I'm not going to be held by this anymore. 
And as you exercise your faith and speak to yourself and begin to turn the key and that latch, you'll hear that squeaky door as it begins to push open and you step into freedom in your life. This is real, friends. This is real. You can be free. Somebody say amen around here. Amen. You can look at your husband and say, I love you and mean that. You can look at your wife and say, you're free. I don't hold you to what you did anymore. I let it go. I dismissed it. I released you from your actions. It's gone. It's so far. My arms will never be long enough ever to reach into the past and grab hold of it and drag it up in front of you again because it's gone. It's released. I let it go. You say, well, I just don't know if I can do that. Well, the Bible commands you to. It says, as Christ Jesus received you, so receive one another. You say, how do I do it? I've already told you how to do it. You got to start speaking to yourself. You got to speak to yourself. You may have to get up in the morning. You may have to pace the floor at night and speak to yourself. When those thoughts begin to harass your mind, you've got to speak louder than those thoughts. You've got to say it and say it and say it and say it until you don't hear those harassing thoughts just depends on if you really want to be free. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. If you would like to receive more information about Rick Renner Ministries, please visit us at renner.org. Start your day on the path towards success and peace as you discover something new from God's Word with Rick Renner's outstanding devotional, Sparkling Gems from the Greek. You may purchase a copy of Sparkling Gems on our website or check us out on iTunes. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. With your support, we will continue to teach, strengthen, and rescue lives in need. Together, we can make a difference.